Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for showing up for my talk today. So um, the topic itself, um, yeah, you might have realized, <laughs> is nothing I'm going to do professionally. <laughs> so um, basically, it's why um, running Kubelet on my vacuum robot is a good or not a good idea. So we're going to see later. <laughs> and everyone can decide for himself. Um, so uh, what about me? Um, I'm using Kubernetes for yeah the best part of the last three years. Um, I've set it up at in various sizes on different architectures, um, also on some some ARM kit before, and um, also you might know Kube Lego, so I abandoned that a bit, <laughs> so that's now um, um, a bit legacy already. Um, and I, um, or my colleague James, um, started Cert Manager, so you should use that, <laughs> definitely. Um, and I'm using vacuum cleaners for more than 25 years. <laughs> and uh, you might not believe that, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first vacuum cleaner back in yeah, the early 90s, I guess. <laughs> so um, what, were we what are we going to look at during this talk? So first, we're going to um, take a quick um, look at the hardware capabilities <coughs> that these vac vac vacuum robots have. So um, they have a quite powerful um, ARM chip in and a couple of other chips. Um, then we're going to look through um, the software stack on the robot itself. So there are various components enabling you to remotely control the, the vacuum. And then I'm going to try to liberate them from the vendor cloud by using a Kubernetes API server. I'm going to show you how I've done that and yeah, how that all works in terms of CRDs and whatever else is involved in Kubernetes on the Kubernetes side. And then I'm trying to show you a demo of them driving, uh, driving around in the room and basically doing their vacuuming. So. <laughs> I hope it's the right topic for the time of day. And all of that is like based on someone else's work, um, so I didn't have to root them myself. Um, uh, basically, there was a talk at the 34C3 event um, where someone showed how to get root access um, to these um, vacuums, and that's where I'm ba basing a lot of my knowledge from. So they have a pretty good documentation. I think this was part of a university project. And um, some other guy reverse engineered um, parts of the vacuum protocol. Um, I'm using that a lot. I also reversed engineer, reverse engineered a few commands myself, so um, there are one or two PRs. And there's actually a Python command line tool to control them. Uh, I also took a look at that. Um, that really helped as well to understand um, yeah, how the API of the, the, the whole vacuum works. So <laughs> it was like, I'm too sure mid-February, and I got like an email from the CNCF that my talk got accepted. My vacuum was still on the way from China, so I didn't have one in my hands yet. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about, yeah, what could I possibly, possibly do with this vacuum? Um, yeah, I had a couple of ideas. Maybe it's a good idea to run a control plane on them, so they have battery. The battery lasts for maybe two days, so it would be quite HA in terms of uh, power outage. And, um, but I think that's probably not enough um, to fill a KubeCon slot, because, um, yeah, other people run Kubernetes on ARM, uh, and yeah, maybe the Wi-Fi mesh network might be interesting, but other than that, it would be quite standard. Um, so I was um, thinking about, yeah, maybe running some actual workloads there or containerizing the vendor's um, proprietary software stack. Um, yeah, I figured it would be probably quite hard to, to actually run containers there, so you need C groups, you need recent kernels, and yeah, so my feeling without even having had one of those vacuums, I knew the kernel was quite old, so maybe I shouldn't try that myself. And um, another idea was maybe some, some kind of combat leak uh, and um, destroy the row or make the, the robots destroy each other, but yeah, the value there is not really um, too much. So I thought like um, I'm, I'm going to work and try to replace parts of the software stack, especially the ones that are like um, yeah, in someone else's cloud without your control. Um, with yeah, own written software and maybe um, persist information into the Kubernetes API. So, looking at the hardware, so you um, yeah, have one of those here. So it's quite um, 
light and has yeah, battery, as I said, for around two days if you don't run and actually make it vacuum. So um, you have a couple of sensors. Error three. Error three. Um, so that is basically a view um, where all the sensors are. So you have a drop sensor so it wouldn't drive off a cliff. Um, you have a speed meter to understand where the vacuum is actually positioned. And yeah, obviously um, the drive. And yeah, maybe going back a bit. And so there exist two hardware revisions. Revisions, this is version one. The version one is way cheaper <laughs> than version two. And it differed in terms of firmware um, quite heavily. So the, the older firmware wasn't really aware of the map in the room, so you couldn't send it to point X, Y, Z. Um, so um, version two was necessary for that. But luckily, in March, they released a new firmware, and I haven't started yet, so I didn't have to do the double work of, of modifying the firmware. That had these V2 features in, so they weren't exposed to the user at that time. But yeah, you could use like a bit more advanced um, path finding um, yeah, ways. Um, also, the, the Wi-Fi is quite a problematic thing, so it's only 2.4 gigahertz, and yeah, we are at the conference, probably everyone experienced a couple of Wi-Fi drops. So um, that is a bit tricky in the later part in the demo, I guess. Um, also, there's a small extension um, port for USB, so USB on to go. Um, I connected a five gigahertz adapter to this one. Um, so <clears throat> that allows you to also um, connect hard disks if you want to run a file server or anything like that. <laughs> um, the, the kernel is quite minimal, so you have to compile your stuff yourself. So I'm able to compile kernel modules, but it was a longer <laughs> night to figure everything out. <clears throat> In terms of CPUs or microcontrollers, so there is a Cortex um, A7 uh, ARM there, so quad core. 512 max of RAM, so you have decent RAM at least to run a couple of Go binaries. So um, you have a four gigabyte flash, and it comes usually with um, yeah with a, a couple of partitions, so you can recover if you have a failed firmware upgrade. So um, that's. Uh, Speaking about the firmware, so the vacuum stack is based on U-boot, then it's booting a, a kernel 3.4, so quite old. It's some, some Android kernel, so it has a heavy modifications uh, in there. And they uh, run a Ubuntu long-term service, so you can actually go and SSH into the robot and apt-get install <laughs> Tmux or whatever you might want to have. Um, the, the next thing, or the other open source component, is Player 3.10. So Player is like a robot um, yeah, co control demon. So it supports like sensors and moving vehicles. So um, yeah, I, I liked, or at the beginning, I wanted to connect directly with this robot API because um, it seemed like to be the point where all the information is in. Um, but it was actually quite hard, so I could um, uh, somehow this player version must have been heavily modified or some binary protocol and I couldn't really uh, um, speak to it with the, the kind of client tools I had. Um, so um, I had to take a bit of a different approach and the different approach uses um, the proprietary vendor software. So um, yeah, I'm not too sure if I pronounced that correctly but the, the vendor Xiaomi um, uh, has like um, some, some kind of cloud protocol where you can connect all sorts of IoT devices. Um, and yeah, that's one component. Then the other component is like managing the robot um, and the communications between the cloud and um, the, 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 the kind of um, controller software that's actually driving the robot through connection with the, the player API. So I tried to draw that a bit. Not too sure how accurate it is, but um, so you have player here sitting, um, connecting to all the sensors, then you have the robot controller. So the green ones are the quite propriety um, components. And um, then basically the app proxy is the interface for the kind of Mayo client, which is the component that connects it to the cloud. Um, the cloud connection can happen via TCP and UDP. It's some A AES. Uh, encryption on top, and it's more uh, datagram style. So UDP, you 
can lose packages, so there are sequence numbers. And um, there was actually a quite good um, C implementation that I took and um, we have worked as a base for, for my Golang uh, cloud client. <coughs> Then on the, on the server side, you also have some, some kind of bypass of this Mayo client, which is used for uploading um, the, the cleaning maps to the, the kind of cloud. And, and they go to, through a, um, a S3 bucket and directly, so you can't really intercept that easily. So how would that work with the smartphone app? So a smartphone app um, connects to the cloud, and then just the cloud proxies it through, uh, encrypts it, and the commands the smartphone sends can also be sent locally. Like in, if you're in the Wi-Fi, it communicates directly with um, um, with the device. Um, uh, so the the basic model is like um, the vacuum comes up with an access point. You're gonna pair it and then connect it to your home Wi-Fi, and then that's the the, the the kind of model it talks to the cloud. So going a bit more or looking a bit more specifically about the protocols. So um, there's the robot protocol, so that's like the protocol, the, um, the um, Android app or iPhone app speaks. So it's JSON-based um, request response, so like drive uh, to that point or start cleaning, um, and then basically you get a response okay or whatever. And um, then the kind of cloud protocol, as I said, wraps the JSON protocol and is used for, for insecure channels or for the public internet, um, just to make sure you apply some uh, encryption to that. Um, so why do I want to <laughs> liberate it from the cloud, as I called it? Um, so, so basically, you don't have no control over your data. Um, the, the 34C3 talk showed that there are some interesting <laughs> commands in terms of uh, privacy. So you, the robot supports to TCP dump your Wi-Fi <laughs> and upload it somewhere. So that might be something um, that uh, with quite sensitive data. And yeah, obviously it can be enabled like from, from the cloud side of things. Um, also, uh, who knows what's going to happen in five years' time, if they're still going to support the robot or not. Um, so maybe I can still spin up a Kubernetes 1.8, 10 in that time and um, make it connect to that. Um, also, like the, the manuals um, don't contain anything, how the, they handle data and what kind of guarantees um, you, you're going to get. And so rather take control um, of the, the thing yourself. So how is the whole Kubernetes um, coming into play there? Um, basically, um, I used Kubernetes, or Kubernetes was the first really larger scale distributed system I worked with. Um, and yeah, I understand it quite well now. And yeah, I, I think it can be applied to a lot of other problems. Um, so for example, <laughs> the vacuum um, sending its status information to, the, um, to some central point. Um, and that's why I wanted to, yeah, use Kubernetes and use some basic or extension concepts of it. Um, and yeah, you can just benefit from all the kind of tooling around Kubernetes. So if you want to make sure that only you can control your robot or you want to give someone else access to certain subcommands, you might be using RBAC and <laughs> create certain roles for um, your vacuum and then make sure nobody else is... Um, Figuring out the commands, you can use the, the audit logs then and use kubectl to, to figure out how many robots you have and label them into rooms and <laughs> whatever else. So, and um, also you can monitor them. So uh, it's quite easy to um, add the annotation to make Prometheus scrape your, uh, scrape your, your actual um, robot and um, use that somehow to alert you when something goes wrong. So what did I do? Um, so I placed a component on the, to the robot and replaced the Mayo client. I called it Rocklet. Um, and this component is then taking care of the communications with the app proxy. And it also um, um, makes sure that it forwards everything to the API server. Cheapctl then uses um, the, the kind of um, normal way of just connecting to the API server, and then things are taken from there, and 
you make sure that um, the whole thing um, yeah, is executed on the actual robot itself. So um, what is the rocklet exactly doing? So I called it a fake kubelet. So um, it's basically doing similar things than that the kubelet is doing, but not running any containers or anything like that. So it's posting a node update um, every couple of seconds. It has a few conditions that it can uh, put onto the node object. And it yeah, also makes sure that it taints itself that no normal workloads are like landing on the, the nodes that get created there. Um, the reason for, for going with that approach was for me that I wanted to use like higher level um, objects, so everything that uses po pods like in the kind of background, like for example a, a cron job was the thing I was thinking about, or jobs in general. Um, you, you might want to run a regular cleanup of a certain room and you can then make sure that a pod gets created whenever you want to clean your room um, by using pods there um, as the kind of um, object that your fake rocklet fake kubelet is, is watching. Um, so that is like a spec for, for one of these pods. Um, so, so basically I'm just using the image name as the command um, and the first argument is expected to be a JSON. So certainly not the most cleanest <laughs> approach, but um, it works reasonably well. And then these commands, they are just forwarded to the app proxy edit with a few um, kind of values there. And um, basically the pod status keeps the, the status of the execution. So if you got back an OK or a failed, it marks the pod as OK or failed, uh, succeeded or failed. So how can we do uh, a scheduled cleaning now? So basically, um, let me just show to the right window. Rocklet, no. Sorry, <laughs> should have prepared that better. Go lang. So everything that I um, I've done is, is basically written in Go, and I'm pushed it just to GitHub. So if you want to run that yourself, um, it's probably <laughs> not good enough documented. So it's just an empty readme <laughs> file for now. And so basically, the way um, to to schedule a regular Cleaning would be, for example, this cron job here. So I hope it's large enough for everyone to see. <clears throat> so that thing um, will make sure that according to this schedule, so it's um, um, UTC, so uh, 25 past two in our time, um, there should be like a robot cleaning something. <laughs> That's the idea of this cron job. And, um, and I can now just um, apply that. To make sure I don't overrun with my presentation and, and have enough time for the demo. And so basically, whoa, there we are. Um, this will create a pod at the time and should make the robot move. Um, I also um, wanted to investigate a bit more about kubectl exec, so um, I knew that um, there's some, some kind of WebSocket connection. And um, the idea was you kubectl exec into the robot and have some kind of remote control features like up, down, left, right, clean, go back to the dock. Um, so that's like how that looks like, um, a little screenshot. And yeah, basically, um, we have um, three robots in total, and we only have space for two on the flights back, so we're going <laughs> to raffle out one after, and uh, yeah, the idea is to use that um, as the kind of um, um, way to distinguish who's the best uh, and uh, earns the robot. <laughs> um, so I wanted to have more status than just the, the, the kind of status that is attached to a node object. So um, basically, um, I used CRDs for um, posting that status into the Kubernetes API. Um, the vacuum CRD contains like a map where the vacuum actually is and, and um, reports its path that it drove through the room. And then 
also has some status objects like audio volume, fan speed, whatever. I think in the future somebody could implement a spec field as well, or a spec struct. Currently I don't have any value there, um, so I'm just reporting status back there. That's how that looks like. So um, you can get the battery level and how much um, area has been cleaned in, in square meters and um, yeah, just the, the fan power that is used for, for cleaning. Um, another object is the cleaning itself. So every run creates a cleaning object. Uh, it's actually persisted on the vacuum itself um, by default. So there's a SQLite database containing all the maps in there. And yeah, it has a couple of more information. So like how much area was covered? Um, did it complete? What was the error code? So um, the kind of maps thing was quite interesting. So I'm aware of at least three formats. <laughs> on the vacuum um, uh, that contained the, the, the map of the room. And so, so, so basically, um, you have one in this archived format, you have one that is the actual live map, and I really cared to get like the live status art, so I had to implement them both. Um, and um, also the path information, you have a couple of coordinate systems to convert <laughs> to and from, so uh, I had to use at least three to get like from the vacuum to the browser in the end. Um, um, the whole thing, um, I wasn't too sure if I really should put like the, the kind of point information where the room is into, the, into a YAML um, format, so I, I just embedded a PNG as base64 um, with that information because it's like, yeah, a bit less storage and every update um, you have to upload like the full information so you um, would have a lot of traffic, and yeah, that's why I just went for the PNG there. And um, then I also wanted to investigate a bit um, with a front-end kind of side of things. Um, I tried Elm before, but I never really used it with the back-end, and I, I really wanted to, to have like a client go speaking to, um, speaking to the API server and then updating a front-end with it. And so, yeah, it, it actually worked quite nice. So I, I'm having an Elm front end that draws the path onto the maps that are PNGs. Um, and it, yeah, uses the cached information in Client Go to, to yeah, list objects, CRDs. And um, even if something changed, the back end triggers the front end, hey, this uh, CRD with name and namespace has changed. So the front end can reload it and it will just auto update. So. That was actually something that went quite smoothly, so I'm not too much of a front-end guy, but uh, um, it was really doable, like, you know, let's say two days or something like that, to, to get something uh, going there. And so that's how the um, thing looks like. Um, it's, yeah, basically just a kubectl get vacuums um, visualization here. And that's how a map looks like. Um, so the, 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 the kind of census, um, yeah, sense where in the room the robot is by using a LiDAR. Um, and yeah, you can draw the path, um, especially here. So the, the, the actual, um, so that's our Airbnb, which is on a houseboat, <laughs> which was quite interesting as well, um, because it leans a bit. <laughs> so the robot is not that safe there. And so it marks areas where, where it's actually quite difficult for him to drive, so like this, um, this is like the kitchen table, and it always got stuck here, so you can see that in the path there. Um, so now just like quickly about the kind of um, metrics I'm going to export. So it's the same information like in the CRDs. I'm just exporting like the, the total um, amount of uh, um, yeah, area covered um, over this SQLite history, basically. So you have a nice counter and can draw it, so I didn't go that far to run Prometheus, but in theory it shouldn't be a hard thing to <coughs> get those metrics uh, recorded and visualize them later. So basically, now is the time for the demo, and I have uh, big concerns that it might work, <laughs> might not work. Um, so basically we tried it this morning, <laughs> everything was fine, but um, when I just wanted to set up the Wi-Fi, the robots didn't connect. <laughs> So um, we can have a look now if it's better, but I would say <laughs> it's pro potentially not. So that was the drive this morning. So this is this room. Um, 
I, I never was in a room that big with a robot, so <laughs> I wanted to have like a couple of hours this morning. Uh, and so basically that was the drive um, that we did this morning. And so I'm going to figure out um, shortly if they're going to be alive now. It doesn't look like. Um, <clears throat> so um, let me just do a little command line. Cubectl get. So that is a really nice command as well. <laughs> So I named the three robots um, according to the founders of Kubernetes, so I, I was not more creative, sorry about that. And um, so basically that are the CRDs that I was speaking about, and you can also see the nodes. Um, so yeah, the problem is it says not ready here, so they should have connected if you would have Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's something I can't show. Um, so. Um, I'm going to run. James? No. Yeah, so the problem is um, I can't easily go into these robots now because I can't connect to the Wi Fi. And that was the last thing I tried before <laughs> to just set up some Wi Fi. So I'm hope, uh, hoping to get it running for the stand and the kubectl um, exec thing I was talking about. But yeah. <laughs> I won't be able to show it now here on stage. So I think I'm suggesting <laughs> we're running through the UI, and then um, um, I, I can show a few things about the, the CRD update mechanism. Um, so, so, so basically, the, that was the, the run this morning. Um, so when I click on Start, it will send a post to my backend. And if I actually do now a kubectl get pods, I should see this kind of command. So eight seconds ago, we have the Rocklet UI CMD. Uh, there's a YAML missing, which actually contains like the, the, the information that I clicked on. Um, so basically, the what's this back? It's back. You can see the argu arguments are empty, and I wanted to have an image called start. Um, a bit more interesting is because like you have to convert a lot of coordinates. If you click here, the front end sends to the robot, go to this position, and it's really, really I'm really, really annoyed that it's not working because I, um, it, it's like quite interesting because it's really accurate um, and driving exactly to that point. Um, so we should see now um, another pod um, has been created and. That one contains the arguments. It converts like in the, 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 the kind of pixel-based. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Sorry, I didn't really realize. So now if we look at that, we should be able to see an image command go to target. And these are the coordinates um, that I clicked on in the browser. And yeah, <laughs> on a better day, <laughs> the robot would have driven to that coordinates. Um, and basically, the map gets live updated every couple. Oh, every time the map changes, I'm sending out an update to the Kubernetes API. And yeah, the changes there are like immediate. Um, so um, let me just do like maybe a split screen here. So. Um, no. Um, for example, uh, with using the edit command here, so um, I'm editing now the robot Joe, which is um, so. So here you can see all the the kind of path objects. So when I go into this one, this is the actual kind of map that is contained here, and the path is quite static, so it's it's only operating in this smaller area. And for example, with changing the fan power here, um, Elm or the, my, the client Go watches the changes to the events and it's going to send a notification to the front end that actually will change now once I click enter 
the kind of fan speed to the AT, like right immediately. So that would be something nice for the Kubernetes dashboard <laughs> or anything like that. So I'm not too much of a front-end guy, I'm not too sure what they're using, but it was really easy to implement that. And so the way that works is that the UI basically connects, um, connects um, with a WebSocket to the backend and then is waiting for watches and it's just getting like the key um, resource name, um, namespace and name of the of the object that changed and then reloads it. Um, the whole thing is like API compatible um, with, with the Kubernetes API, so the front end can, can be targeted to the Kubernetes API and it will still um, be able to list um, those. So it, I definitely always thought about creating a front end like this for CRDs and uh, yeah, it was the first time I actually tried it. It's really helpful. I could easily see like generating some, some Elm code um, from the API struct to be um, like quickly able to decode it. Um, so back to the slides and a couple of more um, ideas. Um, so I'm really sorry that the, the demo didn't work out, so I <laughs> should have recorded a bit more this morning. Um, so yeah, the problem um, is uh, yeah, to do that properly and run your own vacuum status site online and maybe sell it to customers, you need to, to um, invest way more. So I just, I just like hacked it together in the last two weeks. <laughs> and um, I think um, there are a couple of problems, like um, you should use a, your own API server, you should build it from scratch instead of just using CRDs, you have way more control. Um, for example, um, the list commands, so kubectl get vacuums shouldn't contain the path and the maps because it just makes it quite slow. Um, so um, that could be easily achievable, I guess, for the customer API server. And yeah, maybe I should use a different namespace for different tenants. Um, that has problems with the nodes because nodes are not namespaced, obviously. Um, so that leads to a next problem, maybe create like a cron job for a vacuum job and a vacuum cron job in CRDs or in custom objects. So it involved quite a lot, so, and I just went down the quick and easy route. And yeah, as I said, some generators for Elm would be really helpful. I had to, every time I changed the struct, <laughs> I had to do it manually and it was quite um, tedious. And uh, um, yeah, the whole kind of story around Prometheus would be interesting. Um, I think um, Grafana supports nice maps, maybe with the, um, so there's actually a sensor how full the, the kind of dust bin is. <laughs> so you could find out which spots in your room are, uh, tending to be the, the, the ones with most dust. And yeah, so I wanted to write a controller that is actually matching the maps of the vacuums and then doing something more intelligent like on an API um, server level. So that would be an interesting controller. But yeah, so that's about it. So um, yeah, the idea is that at 3 p.m. <laughs> somehow you can remote control it <laughs> using kubectl exec. So hopefully the Wi-Fi will work. And yeah, that was my talk. I'm really sorry about <laughs> that I couldn't show anything. And yeah.